Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is the discovery of anesthetics. And uh, to get there, I'm going to have to talk about the Battle of Thermopylae, which will be obscure to you at this point, but I'll get into it. Um, and I just want to say that my interest in this, I'm not an anesthesiologist, and my interest in this is, I'm a neuroscientist, but my interest is really no different um, from yours. And that was because of a personal experience um, with pain. Pain is real. So uh, I spent uh, two weeks in a Berlin hospital recently with compartment syndrome. And uh, every day I was in extreme pain. And I couldn't believe um, that I could tolerate it. It was my entire personality was overtaken by this single concept of pain. I couldn't read. Uh, I had difficulty talking to people. Uh, I had difficulty making sense. And I was, uh, I, you know, I am a neuroscientist, and so I couldn't uh, understand why I was unable to overcome this because pain is not real. Pain is completely a subjective experience. So all of our senses, to some extent, are a subjective experience. But at least with vision, there are photons bouncing around in this world. There are odors uh, that are in this world. Our brain will convert those into pleasant, sweet smells or uh, horrific, uh, um, repulsive smells. That's subjective. But pain is no nothing aspect. And there's no aspect about this that is objective. It's all subjective. The truth is that pain is in your mind. It is an invention of your mind. And so um, somehow uh, your br brain is taken over by this concept of pain uh, and all other thought processes are confused, are completely lost. So uh, it's not without help. Uh, and so there are compounds, natural compounds, in the world that can relieve pain. And so it's uh, interesting that there are plants like the opium poppy uh, that make um, opium and that relieves pain. And so one question is, why do plants make substances that mess with our minds? And uh, you know, this is something I thought about when I was a kid. Why should a plant be bothering to make opiates? And it's probably, it, we don't know the answer to that, but it probably has to do uh, with the formation of pesticides or antibiotics, things that protect the plant. And so often these compounds will also work against insects. But we're not really sure about that. The other issue is why do these substances that the plants have, uh, have an effect on our mind? And I think in the last few years, we've made great progress to understanding why that's true. And the reason is, is that these compounds mimic endogenous compounds in our own brain. And that is because the brain works based on small molecule chemistry. Nerve cells communicate with one another via neurotransmitters. And these are small molecules, many um, which resemble some of these plant alkaloids that have an effect on our brain. And so the plants don't intend to mess with our minds. Uh, they're making compounds for other reasons, and then they accidentally um, have an effect on our brains. It may be that this uh, is acting in the same way on insects or, or uh, uh, bacteria, um, but we don't really know that. So the take home message of my talk today is, uh, first, how um, were uh, neuroactive substances discovered? They were discovered by accident. Uh, and how do they work? They mimic endogenous compounds. The neuroactive substances I'd like to talk about today are anesthetics. And so just a few definitions so you understand what I mean by an anesthetic. So anesthetics um, cause a loss of sensation. There are general anesthetics um, that cause loss of consciousness, so sensation in all aspects uh, of our, uh, our brain and our body. In fact, they simply put us to sleep. Then there are local anesthetics, and this leads to local loss of sensation. So when the doctor puts Novocaine in your cheek, you lose all sensation, you know, both po positive sensation and unpleasant sensation. Then there's analgesics, and this is a separate class. This is a narrower class. These suppress pain only and not all other sensations. So, but I'll be talking about anesthetics today. And so um, the issue is how were anesthetics discovered? And so for this, um, we have to go way back in time. We have to jump 2,500 years um, back to 500 BCE. And so what was going on in 500 BCE? This was the time of the Persian Wars, so the wars between Persia uh, and Greece. And so the uh, uh, emperor of Persia, Darius the Great, 
wanted to conquer all of the Middle East, and he pretty much did so. So uh, Egypt, Phoenicia, and all other uh, civilizations um, were dominated by Persia. And so he, the last holdout was Greece, and so he invaded Greece uh, in 490 uh, BCE, uh, and he was defeated by the Athenians at the Battle of Marathon. Uh, and so he was very unsatisfied with that. He wanted to return, and he started building up a large army. But before he could do so, he died, uh, and he was replaced by his son Xerxes. And Xerxes took over um, this vengeance, vengeance from his father and decided that he would finally defeat the Greeks. And he would do this by building an army and a navy that was paralleled by none in history. So uh, the army is estimated to be uh, about 150,000 soldiers. Uh, some of the estimates range up to 300,000. Um, and Herodotus was a questionable uh, historian, said that it uh, was over a million soldiers. So in 480 BCE, uh, he builds this army and he marches on Greece. So he started from Sardis here in Persia. Uh, and the uh, targets of his vengeance were in particular the Athenians and the Spartans because those are the ones that had resisted his father. So uh, the Spartans and Athenians, like all good Greeks, uh, if they were going to undergo some massive uh, uh, undertaking, such as a war, um, they would always go to the Oracle of Delphi to try to get some predictive um, uh, inf information from her, as well as advice. And so the Oracle of Delphi was at the Temple of Apollo in the town of Delphi. So the Oracle of Delphi, the, the Greeks would pose a question to her, uh, and then she would go into a chamber that was below the, uh, uh, the entranceway um, to the temple, and she would stay down there for about an hour until uh, she was overcome with visions, and then she would emerge, and then often babbling um, nonsense, uh, that would have to be interpreted by the priests and the people who were uh, asking the questions. And so she gave two pieces of advice amongst a bunch of other stuff that seemed like nonsense, but this uh, made sense to the Athenians. So to the Athenians, she said, flee. Your statues uh, are, are bleeding blood, um, and there will be nothing left of uh, Athens. So you will fight another day, uh, and only a wall of wood will remain uncaptured. O cruel Salamis, many mothers' sons will die. So though that's what was told um, to the Athenians. To the Spartans, she said, either your city will be completely destroyed or will use your, you will lose your king. Um, you must choose. And so uh, this wasn't exactly clear, um, and so it was open to, to interpretation. But the Athenian general, uh, Themistocles, interpreted this to say that we must uh, do two things. We must uh, form a navy, we must fo form an army, uh, and we must stop the Persians before they get into uh, Peloponnesia and into Athens. And so uh, they then uh, move the army, the Greek army, up to Thermopylae, and this is centered on 300 Spartans, the king and their very best warriors. In addition, they had uh, Thebans and Thespians, uh, hoplites, who uh, defended with them to bring the total to uh, 7,000. So now they faced uh, this army of uh, 150,000 um, uh, Persians. Uh, and we'll get to a moment about why they did that. The Greek uh, the Athenian navy sailed to Artemisium and blocked the entrance uh, to Thermopylae so that they would, the navy would be unable to help the uh, soldiers and outflank uh, the Greeks. So uh, then what uh, uh, Xerxes did is he came up to the Hellespont, he built pontoon bridges so that these, the, the armies could cross, the, uh, into, cross Hellespont and move into Europe. Uh, his father had been destroyed, his navy had been destroyed by a storm off of Athos, and so he dug a canal across this uh, spit of land that's actually quite wide uh, to pass his uh, ships, and you can see this to this day. Uh, so the, the canal remains, it's no longer filled with water, um, but you can still observe it. And so these were two engineering uh, feats that had never, are unparalleled in history uh, at the time. And so then they um, sailed and marched down uh, to Thermopylae, where they ran into the Greeks 
who were blocking the narrow passageway, uh, and then they uh, ran into the Athenian navy at Art Artemisium. And so, fortunately for the Greeks, a storm arose, and the uh, uh, Persians lost about 20% of their ships. Uh, and then a uh, second storm uh, destroyed many more of them. Uh, and then there was a battle that ensued that was a stalemate. So they really couldn't, they stopped the uh, Persians, but they couldn't destroy them. Meanwhile, in Thermopylae, the uh, uh, Greek army faced this huge 150,000 uh, numbered soldiers. But it was a very narrow passageway. And so uh, the 300 Spartans uh, held the line and they pushed um, the Persians into the sea. And so they held them for seven days, two days of pitched battle, and they still held their ground. Finally, they were betrayed by a local who showed the Persians how they could sneak around them on a trail, and so they outflanked them. And so uh, the Spartans sent all the other Greeks away uh, to protect their own cities, uh, with the exception of the Thespians, and so the Spartans and the Greeks uh, remained and uh, had a blocking maneuver, uh, and eventually all of them were killed. So uh, it's now, these are of course Greek heroes. It's one of the most famous uh, unequal battles in the history of, of warfare, um, but it really was a defeat um, because now the plains were open for the Persian army to enter uh, Greece proper. And so the, uh, the, the Athenians retreated to Athens and they emptied the city and they sent everybody to an island off of the coast called Salamis, which uh, could protect the population. But the city of Athens was open uh, it was sacked by the Persians and completely destroyed. The navy then continued around uh, and were about to defeat the Athenian navy. What happened was there were 270 Greek triremes. These are actually very slow ships, despite later they became uh, famous for their speed in battle. Uh, and they faced uh, 800 Persian ships. So what they did was they backed into a very narrow portion of this canal uh, and as the uh, as the Persians attacked, uh, the numerical advantage uh, was lost. In fact, it became a problem. So suddenly, uh, the, the first the ships began to back. They acted like they were afraid, and the Persians uh, broke ranks. And then suddenly, they all rushed forward, and they drove the uh, Persians against the coast, and uh, much of their fleet was destroyed. So at this point, uh, Xerxes realized that um, winter is coming, and he needs to get out. Uh, before the Greeks destroy the, the bridges at the Hellespont. So most of the army is, uh, retreats, uh, and a general remains trying to uh, fight pitched battles with the Greeks. Uh, and eventually there's a, the wall at Corinth they can't pass. Uh, they try to pull the Greeks, the Greeks into the open and are finally completely defeated at Plataea. So the Persian threat was now gone. So that's pretty interesting, right? I mean, it's a successful battle. But for me, what happened with the oracle, right? Where did, this, where did these visions come from? Uh, and so uh, contemporary accounts, so Plutarch uh, is, was a, actually a priest uh, at the uh, Apollo, uh, at, the, at the oracle's uh, temple. Uh, and he stated that he thought there were volcanic vapors that emerged from the floor of that chamber. And that was what gave rise to her, uh, her, her visions. Many archaeologists have returned to the site, even geologists have returned to the site uh, in the 1800s and 1900s, and they said there are no such fault lines um, that pass through Delphi. This is simply uh, history that's being told by Herodotus and Plutarch and was an invention. But in uh, 2001, uh, a group of geologists, archaeologists, and chemists returned to the site and tried to exp uh, explore it more deeply. And what they found is that the temple actually is at the intersection of two faults. Uh, and they then lowered their instruments into the cracks below uh, the temple, and what they discovered was that ethylene gas was emerging from these faults and would fill uh, the vault of the Oracle of Delphi. So ethylene gas, what is it? Uh, it's a simple compound, it has a simple double bond here. Uh, it's highly flammable, it's explosive, uh, and it's known to emerge from vol volcanoes and volcanic sites. So this makes sense and it confirms Plutarch's and Herodotus's reports. So ethylene gas, so these, this, the, 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 the 
Oracle would re go into this chamber and she would become delirious and uh, was no longer able to think clearly and that's what accounts for the babbling. Why? And that doesn't come until uh, 1798 when perhaps the most famous chemist uh, of Britain, uh, Humphrey Davy, uh, he was only 20 years old when he did this. Uh, he later it was the discoverer of electrolysis and the voltaic battery, uh, discovered a number of elements. But at this point, he was interested in the physiological effects of gases. And so he tried, he built a chamber that he'd enter, they'd pump gas in, and then he would report um, what uh, his responses were. And some of these included ethylene, nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, this one was particularly insane, carbon monoxide. Uh, and so um, he passed out, uh, it was clear that he was dying. Uh, they drug him into the open and he faintly replied, I don't think I shall die. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's wondrous that, that uh, for chemistry uh, that he did not die. Um, but uh, he did note that there is two compounds that had an unusual effect, uh, and this is ethylene and nitrous oxide. And he came out from these feeling absolutely this wonderful warm sensation that was then, oh, he was overcome with laughter. Uh, this is why nitrous oxide is called laughing gas. Uh, and he said that it was a wonderful experience. Uh, and this became known through the population. And so then, uh, uh, Nitrous oxide parties um, were first uh, found throughout England, uh, and then they um, eventually came to the U.S. Uh, and there's poems written about this. is This is one uh, from Robert Southey called "Oh, Excellent Airbag." Uh, and so there is these at these parties, and here they're they're making. Uh, they're making laughing gas, that's nitrous oxide, and uh, everybody's dancing and having a gay old time uh, and laughing their heads off. Uh, and so these became traveling shows in the U.S. Uh, and so Samuel Colt, in particular, the guy who eventually uh, invented the Colt revolver, um, would have these sideshows. They'd set up their tent, uh, and people would come, and they would inhale the gas, and to the amusement of everybody watching, would behave in a goofy manner, uh, and uh, to the hilarity of everyone there. Uh, and so once Horace Wells, who's a dentist in Hartford, Connecticut, was attending one of these things, uh, and he noticed that one of the individuals who was gassed, a volunteer, had hit himself on a bench quite badly and he'd injured himself, but he was completely unaware of the injury until after the gas wore off and then it was clear that he was in severe pain. And so Wells recognized that during this time, this individual felt no pain. And so being a dentist, he knew that dental extractions were done without any sort of anesthetic and they were incredibly painful um, to individuals. And he was also aware of the brutality, the barbarity of surgery that was ongoing until then. And so here is an example of a surgery where there's an amputation. Uh, usually there would be strong men who would hold the individual or they would be strapped down and screaming uh, as um, the, their leg was cut off. Uh, there is an account of a woman uh, who had a breast surgery because she had cancer, and so it was clear she had post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, she would uh, often have anxiety fits afterwards for the rest of her life. So pain isn't forgotten. Pain is a memory that lasts forever. So Wells, again, noted this, that maybe this could be used in dental practice. So he convinces uh, uh, Quincy Colton uh, after the show to come to his uh, dental shop and to give him uh, nitrous oxide. Uh, and then uh, he uh, asked them to pull a tooth. Uh, so one of his colleagues pulled the tooth and he was amazed. I mean, why would you have a perfectly good tooth pulled? Uh, but this is a long history of doctors having, experimenting with drugs on themselves first. Uh, and so he felt no pain and remarked that the, that this was a surgery that had gone on like none other. And he remarked there is now a new era in a dental surgery. Uh, and so this was great. He then perfected his method and he performed over 15 uh, extractions, tooth extractions, and it, they were quite successful. And he now felt like he was ready for the big time. He needed to go to Boston uh, and he would go to Mass General Hospital and display um, this new discovery uh, of the use of nitrous oxide as an anesthetic. 
So he goes to Boston. There he meets uh, his former apprentice, William Morton, who shall appear again in this story, who helped him, helped him set up a lecture uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And so uh, they applied uh, nitrous oxide to one of the patients, and uh, he was about to pull the tooth, but they'd removed the bag too soon. So the patient had recovered before um, he was fully anesthetized. Uh, and so when Wells pulled the tooth, uh, the man screamed in pain. And so uh, the, the, the bleachers shouted humbug, and Wells was booed from the room. So this was highly embarrassing uh, to him. Uh, he was humiliated, but he continued to explore different anesthetics, thinking that maybe there was a better one. The one better one that he discovered was, uh, was uh, uh, chloroform, uh, and he became a chloroform addict. Uh, and this is unfortunate because uh, he would take chloroform every day. Uh, he became incre incredibly erratic. Uh, once during a chloroform binge, uh, he threw acid on the clothing of some prostitutes in the street, uh, and he was arrested. And so now he knew his career was over. He convinced um, the policeman to stop at his house so he could get his shaving kit. Uh, when they weren't looking, he took a bunch of chlor uh, chloroform uh, and slit his artery and, and committed suicide. So Wells's career was, uh, was, uh, was a tragedy. What about his compatriots? So Gardner Quincy Colton, the guy who was running the sideshow uh, and who had seen the tooth extraction, now um, recreates himself uh, as the Cotton Dental Foundation and travels and performs 75,000 successful tooth extractions using nitrous oxide as an anesthetic. And so nitrous oxide now becomes adopted by the dental community. And if you know dentists, uh, many of them still have nitrous oxide tanks uh, in, their, in, their, um, in their shops. William Morton, he was the apprentice, right? The original apprentice who helped him out. Now this individual is now accredited to inventing anesthetics, but just a little background on him. He was a scoundrel, so he moved from town to town, setting up new businesses with a business partner. He would then embezzle all the funds and then skip town. And so he was not um, truly a, an honorable man, um, but he will never have forgotten um, what he saw uh, with this dental surgery um, with Wells. And so he becomes an apprentice to Dr. Charles Jackson uh, in Boston, who is using ether as a local anesthetic. Uh, and so um, Jackson suggested to uh, Morton that maybe you should use pure ether and not just use it locally, but use it generally and apply it via a rubber bag to the individual. So this is diethyl ether. And so Morton extracted a tooth of a patient using this equipment um, without pain. So this is what diethyl ether looks like. It actually looks uh, a lot like ethylene. And here is the moment that's it's now um, uh, celebrated as Ether Day. Uh, we uh, celebrate this in my lab, not with ether, but with beer. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's uh, every October 16th. Is, uh, and so Morton um, then went to the same place. Uh, it's now called the Ether Dome at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, and there was an individual with a tumor on his neck. Uh, he applied uh, diethyl ether before the surgery, uh, and um, the tumor was removed, and the patient didn't feel a thing. And so uh, uh, it's no longer humbug. Uh, the, the surgeon turns around and goes, this is not humbug. This is the real thing. And so uh, at this point, this changed the way we do surgery, uh, and now um, began the era of, of painless uh, surgery. Okay, so now uh, we have to fast forward just 62 years uh, to 1908. Uh, and this is an event that happened here at the University of Chicago, so I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, so carnation growers uh, ship their uh, flowers uh, to, to the markets here in Chicago. And one time, uh, all of the carnations failed to bloom when they reached the market. And so the carnation growers lost a lot of money, and they tried to figure out what that was. And it ended up that uh, there was a contamination of ethylene from their faulty heaters. And so it was reported that the carnations um, had fallen asleep and would not wake up. 
So we now know that this is ethylene to plant hormone. It's released by flowers, it's released by fruit, uh, and if you crowd fruit together, they will, uh, they will uh, ripen faster. And that's because ethylene is destroying the chlorophyll and then the red and uh, yellow pigments show. So uh, Arnold Luckhart at the University of Chicago had read about this and was particularly intrigued by the idea that the carnations had fallen to sleep. And so, once again, in the tradition of uh, medical science, the first thing you want to do is try these things out on yourself. And so, uh, he and his colleagues, he said, we next uh, investigated the analgesic and anesthetic properties on ourselves. A period of excitement, uh, characterized by laughing, preceded the anesthesia. So once again, it's laughing gas, except it's ethylene at this point. And so, in 1924, ethylene is introduced as an anesthetic during general surgery. Uh, and here is ethylene again. And the problem uh, with ethylene and another anesthetic called acetylene, if you, any of you know what acetylene is, it's a highly explosive gas, uh, and, an, uh, uh, and diethyl ether. And all of these are explosives. So uh, I have to just read you some of these accounts. A, a candle ignited a fire uh, which erupted from a patient's mouth during a dental extraction in 18... Uh, 1866, uh, when I beheld the flames gushing forth from his mouth, I almost believed that it was a veritable fire demon sitting before me. When the patient was later asked how he felt, his only answer was that, what a wonderful occurrence. <laughs> Beautiful, <laughs> fire gushing from my mouth. On a more serious note, in January 1929, an anesthesiologist was manipulating the valve on a tank of ethylene gas that exploded. The force of the explosion hurled the physician's body through a six-inch wall. So clearly something had to be done, and these were inadequate uh, anesthetics. And so since then, we've been exploring uh, non-flammable anesthetics. The most common one um, that you've probably heard of now is propofol. Uh, and this is not flammable. It's an injected anesthetic. It's highly effective. Uh, breathing is not um, so affected, uh, and patients come out rapidly and sometimes don't even know that they um, were under anesthesia or that they were unconscious. I just want to close in the last couple of minutes with how do these anesthetics work? Now, we don't really know how um, uh, uh, ethylene or diethyl ether uh, work. Uh, those compounds are less explored because they're no longer used. But let's just review a little bit about neuroscience. And so nerve cells, or neurons, um, uh, connect to one another. And here's a cell body. And they send long processes to the next cell called an axon. And then they form a point of contact called a synapse. And that synapse has a gap between this cell and the downstream cell. And that structure looks like that. And so here's a blow up of that. So its key is that there are these vesicles filled with neurotransmitter molecules, small molecules that sometimes resemble these plant alkaloids. Uh, and so what happens um, is that when this nerve cell becomes excited, an action potential, electrical depolarization, passes along this axon, causes that vesicle to fuse with the plasma membrane, with the cell membrane, and release these small molecules onto receptors, ligand-gated ion channels, that is, the molecule is able to open a hole in the membrane. Uh, and so the way a nerve cell works is it's like a little battery. So it pumps uh, positive ions out, uh, negative ions uh, remain inside. Uh, and so there's a charge between the outside and the inside, and this is a polarized membrane, right? So it's a little battery. Uh, and so what happens at the synapse is those small molecules that are released uh, uh, typically glutamate, or a, pro, uh, a small molecule, uh, which is an amino acid, uh, and another small molecule called GABA, which is also an amino acid. Uh, and they bind these ligand-gated ion channels, so that causes the channel to open, and then positive ions come through uh, on these glutamate receptors, uh, and chloride, or negatively charged ions, come through uh, these GABA receptors. So glutamate acts to excite nerve cells, GABA inhibits nerve cells. So how do these drugs work? It ends up that there are compounds that slip into 
uh, the spaces between the subunits of these receptors. So these are proteins, and each one of these is an individual protein that assembles into a pentamer. Uh, and there are intersubunit sites and intrasubunit sites, and that's where drugs bind. We now have a crystal structure, this is brand new, a crystal, a crystal structure uh, of the protein binding GABA or binding propofol. GABA binds here in this extracellular domain, that's you know, the, in the synaptic cleft between the two cells, uh, and that causes this ion channel to open. Propofol enters this lipid bilayer and then inserts itself um, between these subunits and causes it to open just like GABA does. So it acts uh, to uh, uh, cut the nervous system short and activate these ion channels with or without uh, the release of GABA. So what happens is we now have these charged membranes uh, and this cell is quiescent. Uh, and then what happens with propofol is it opens this GABA receptor and then uh, what happens is that chloride, these negative ions flow into the cell and they calm the cell. Almost every nerve cell in our brain has GABA receptors on it. And so the idea then, and this is still controversial, is that propofol tells all of the nerve cells in the brain to simply go to sleep. And in fact, those things that are sleep aids um, act specifically on GABA receptors uh, that actually put you to sleep. So uh, that's what I'd like to close with. Uh, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have about anesthetics or the Greek battles. <laughs> <laughs>what is it about anesthetics where for some people you have that complete loss of consciousness but in some other patients they they say that they experience during surgeries and stuff where they don't feel anything but they're aware of the surgery they're aware of what's going on yeah so the question is um why are some people uh they're paralyzed by anesthetics uh but they don't have this total loss of consciousness and i happen to be one of those people uh, and so it can be quite disturbing if you're having surgery uh, and you're still awake. Uh, so they, they try to give you drugs that make you forget so you're not traumatized by it, um, but I remember. Uh, <laughs> and we don't know whether that is a, um, a problem, a genetic defect, really, uh, um, or whether enough, not enough anesthetic was given. There's also the flip side, and every time you go to surgery, your anesthesiologist will give you this warning and it really scares you. They say some people will never uh, wake up after the surgery, and this is just, we don't know what it is, but there's, you know, 1% of the population uh, undergoes uh, 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 anesthetic treatment and never wake up. And once again, we don't know whether that's a genetic predisposition, and we'd love to know what those um, genetic changes are. My guess is it has something to do with GABA receptors or, or voltage gate ion channels. The other alternative is that the uh, anesthesiologist is working too many shifts too, uh, too quickly and uh, there's just a mistake and that uh, we, we really don't know um, what the causes are, but I suspect that there's a mix of both. Uh, yeah, so the question is what makes people laugh um, when they're on nitrous oxide or ethylene? And uh, I mean, we ha I have no idea, and this was a conversation we had at dinner last night, could you um, give it to rats? Because, uh, you know, as far as we know, laughter is, is, is uh, mostly confined uh, to uh, primates, uh, and so it doesn't extend to all animals. So we don't know if rats would laugh. But I know um, that I've had dogs, and dogs can play tricks on each other. Uh, mean tricks, right? And you can see this self-satisfaction when the other dog <laughs> falls for it. So I, I know that they're laughing inside, uh, uh, but it would be hard to figure out whether the dog, you know, if you gave him the anesthetic about what, you know, why are they laughing? Uh, but isn't that a great thing, right? I mean, if you, uh, there's some, something about a pleasure center, you know, dopamine, but it's not just pleasure. It's the sense of humor. Uh, and, you know, often when somebody does it, you know, some, something bad physically happens to another person, you laugh even though everything in your body and your brain is saying, 
don't laugh, the person's in pain, but you can't stop and you, I mean, I, Nan, my wife is in the audience, so I can attest to her uh, <laughs> laughing recently when I fell into a fountain and hurt myself badly. So uh, <laughs> uh, 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 it, it, this is also, uh, what is going on with the human sense of humor? Um, so earlier in your presentation, you spoke about pain. In your professional opinion, is there any way to, I guess, genetically modify people so that they will not feel pain? Or are anesthetics the best way to not feel any sort of pain? Yeah, so at this point, it's all drug therapy. Uh, and so uh, morphine, we know what the target of morphine is. Uh, and, uh, and for people who suffer from chronic pain, uh, so uh, cancer patients uh, eventually become, uh, uh, they tolerate morphine. And then there's a drug called uh, conotoxin, uh, pre-alt is what the drug's name is, and those, that is effective on um, chronic pain, and that acts on a, a calcium channel. So at this point, people are trying to develop better drugs uh, that pass through uh, the blood-brain barrier to act on that or to uh, pass into um, the nervous system so that you can turn off those pain receptors. Uh, so those are the, the best effective techniques now we have now. Could you build, make something? Um, yeah, you, you probably could. I mean, I can think of a way. You knock out the anti-calcium channels in the C, C fibers, and that would knock out pain. So yeah, I could make a model. I could probably make a mouse right today that doesn't feel pain. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you.